Uh, thank you so much for, for joining. Um, so uh, some other things that I might that might help us have a, a more enjoyable time here as well is if you have questions as we go along, you can throw them in the chat. I will uh, sporadically look down there at the little chat box and see what's going on. And if you have any comments and I can try and respond to them, um, throw in your questions as early as possible so that I can get to answering them. I would uh, love to know already uh, where you're coming from is lovely to know, but also if you're expecting to learn anything from this talk or if there's any expectations in the room um, or anything that you would be curious to leave this event with, maybe you could uh, write one or two sentences about that. So I'm, I'm interested to learn about how to craft experiences. I uh, would love to learn uh, when a ritual does and doesn't work. I would love to even know what a ritual is. Um, might be some uh, some expectations. So if you can write them down already in the chat, then I can start to get a bit of a sense for the room that we are here in together. All right. So I hope everyone can see my screen. I would assume so, if everything's working uh, and hasn't changed in the last five minutes. So yeah, uh, here we're today to talk about ritual design and, and the art of crafting meaningful experiences. And I hope we can leave uh, with some great knowledge and, and create an impact for our users. So a little bit about me and why I'm speaking about this, hopefully to help uh, reassure you that <laughs> this will be uh, an interesting conversation at least to listen to. Uh, so my name's Adam. My initials are actually ABC. My father had a good joke when I was born and, uh, and I was actually born on Friday the 13th. So uh, lucky for some and lucky for others. For me, I found it to be mostly lucky. So that's great. So there's two things that are quite interesting. Um, I am Australian um, and uh, I'm very excited about this topic of ritual design. So if there's a moment where you're like, whoa, Adam, slow down, I've lost it. And we are a very international crowd. So I assume that for a lot, English is a second language. So if I'm getting too excited or talking too fast or uh, you missed something, then feel free to like put up your hand or do a thumbs down or a thumbs up. And that way I can kind of slow down, remember that I'm in a virtual event and uh, kind of repeat the important stuff and make sure that isn't lost. So uh, uh, just a fair warning. Um, and if I use slogans like Arvo instead of afternoon, then you can also uh, put in your, your, your hand gestures there. Um, yeah, so I'm a service designer. Um, I have been for the last uh, eight years or so or, or something. And uh, currently I'm placed at Zalando. So Zalando for those outside of the EU, uh, is is one of the largest fashion retailers online. Uh, we are, uh, I think, about 20,000 people. And in, we have a design team that's including copy strategy, uh, voice of customer and analytics of about 100, 120 people. So it's quite a large organization uh, that I work for. But before that, I was at a design agency. And before that, I was working for a startup here um, around uh, building a community of innovators. But I'll touch on some of those uh, a little bit later. I, I'm also the co-host of SDD, so uh, Service Design Drinks in Berlin. And before that, uh, we were spent five years hosting the Service Design Jam. So if you're new to the world of service design, I would encourage you to check out the Service Design Jams and also maybe your local Service Design Drinks. Actually, funnily enough, if you're in Berlin or if you're anywhere at the moment, uh, we actually have a talk from the Service Design Show host uh, called uh, Mark Fontaine, and he's going to be talking to us uh, later today. So I've got two events, amazing events happening today, uh, which is really exciting. So that's a little bit about me. Um, yeah, let's get on to the next thing. So I want to start off with a question just to engage you a little bit and to, to have some common, common understandings and some things we can uh, uh, bond over. Maybe the ritual is called icebreakers. Let's see what, how this works. But I would love you to write in the chat, uh, what was your favorite childhood ritual? Take, and this also just reassures me that you're alive and that you're actually there, that I'm not in a computer simulation talking to bots, but uh, that these are real people. Um, if you can just write down in the comments or in the chat, uh, what was your fi uh, favorite childhood ritual? And while I'm waiting for you to answer this question uh, and think of them, I have to say one of my favorite childhood rituals was uh, saying grace. So I grew up religious and you'll hear a little bit about this. Getting my school bag ready. Nice. Oh, love it. Thank you for going first. Um, one of mine was saying grace because that was always a nice time and uh, a place to, to be thankful for, for people and, and cooking. 
I didn't realize at the time that it was my favorite childhood ritual, but now getting older, I really appreciate the power of being thankful for things. So I think that was one thing that I realized a little bit later. But when I was a child, probably one of my favorite childhood rituals was BMX training every Wednesday night. I used to really get excited for BMX training uh, and riding my bike. So that was one favorite childhood ritual. That was a really great bonding time for me and my father as well. Painting every in evening. Wow. Christmas swims. I, I mean, for Australia, it's very normal for us to go swimming in Christmas, but I'm, I assume that if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, Christmas swims might be a different kind of ritual. That's for sure. Good ones. Great. Keep them coming. Uh, very nice answers. Staying with my grandparents during the summer holidays. Oh, very good. Okay. I love these rituals. Very good ones. I'm going to, I'm going to reading, uh, reading, getting your parents to read before a bedtime. That's fantastic. All right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about in the first section of this talk about why I think rituals are so important, how I came to discover the rituals and what ritual design is all about, um, and why it's important to be intentful when you're creating rituals. And then on the second half, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we at Zalando have actually put this uh, ritual design into practice, what that looks like, um, and maybe even share some insights from uh, the team members that we've been working with to, to develop this. So we'll also have some practical application and maybe we can use it as a bit of a case study for the discussion later on in the talk. So let me get started. So, um, and keep up, keep coming with the rituals as well and the questions as well. Please add those uh, into the chat. Um, yeah, so as a service designer and as a designer in general, I was always... Um, interested in getting people to uh, design things for humans. And I think my ego a little bit here was, I would love to create things that have impact on others and not just impact on customers, but uh, not just impact on users either, but impacts on the humans around me. I would like to create a world where, where they can benefit and that it's better. I was always amazed. I think one of the first projects in the lecturers that I had at university was, you know, he's like pointed out an object and I think it was a motorbike. And he's like, I helped create that and design that for people. And now they use it. And I was always interested by this. Um, and that was always the dream when I came into service design. So my background was industrial design and then I moved over to service design. Um, always impact interested in how I could create uh, impactful services for the people around me. So how I could really help them achieve what they wanted to do. And this was like really at the essence of why I became a designer. But then what, what happened was that um, from this great ambition of helping and having impact and you know wanting to see my creations out in the world and people using them and benefiting them, I ended up realizing and actually in, in, in <laughs> besides having your designs when you're in an agency, be put in the drawer. And once you finally do get your designs out in the world that it often feels like you're in an endless checklist of ticking off things or you're dealing with GDPR regulations or legal requirements or, or complacency tests or uh, scheduling user research or having endless debates with your colleagues about uh, redundant things and not actually creating impact for the end user or the humans that are in your, uh, in your, in your sphere of influence. And I was a little bit disheartened and I was a little bit dismayed and I was like, ah, oh, this is so frustrating. I really want to create great things for people but I can't, I'm stuck, I'm lost, you know? And all of these things are really important and it's good to be very thorough in your designs and think about the consequences and applications of your designs. Uh, make sure that we're abiding by the, the, the rollout and making sure that backend can actually build the things that you're crafting. These are all super important things, but I was a little bit dismayed that I was like, where is the connection and the feedback from the people that I wanted to be designing for? So I was also, whilst going through this process of, of thinking about this, I was uh, reminded of how I had grown up. So I had grown up in a quite a religious uh, circle, uh, although in the time I would have said it was definitely not religious. Uh, so I grew up in a, a Pentecostal church, for those who don't know. And uh, I found this time really, really interesting. Obviously, I've moved on since then, and uh, I'm no longer involved in the church. But one of the key things that I really, really appreciated about that time and growing up in this community was really the, the community and the people were at the center. The humans that I was interacting with, I could really felt a sense of belonging with them. And I really felt connected and I really felt safe and understood, but also there was a sense of, of this uh, people at the, at the heart of it. And this people space is what really attracted me to this kind of uh, thing. And I remember going away on a youth camp 
and, and having amazing moments and coming back so ecstatic with life and excitement and such a sense of belonging and understanding of who I was and who I was in this context. And, and that really helped develop me. And I was missing that a little bit in the professional world of, of actually having impact. I mean, that's my job now, but it seems like it's more disconnected from what it was back then when I was growing up. And one thing that I realized what made it so amazing when I dived a little bit further uh, and deeper into it was that what built these connections uh, was really intangible things that we were after. We were all understanding of the same beliefs that we had. We were coming together over, over reasons um, and, and faith. But um, one thing that made that faith very tangible and practical were the rituals that we had. And so here's a little a sketch that I drew um, just of uh, the, the general Sunday service kind of format. First, you welcome everyone. Then there's some singing. And then there will be a sermon. And then afterwards, you might have a coffee with some uh, people in the congregation. And then after that, you would be talking about the sermon or catching up every week with them. And then after that, I remember we always invited one or two families back to our house to have a big roast on a Sunday lunch. And uh, this kind of rituals, um, and even if you go into the, the smaller rituals, the ones of saying grace and being thankful, or the fact that, uh, you know, uh, we would have Bible studies on a Wednesday to connect with a small group, or the ones that we had in the youth group, it was all built upon uh, rituals. And rituals were really at the heart of what made this community and this people space work so well within the church that I was attending and going to and what really connected me with the values of everyone else. So there was these big ideas of faith and coming together over different things and, and understanding. But what really made that connection for me to other people were the rituals that it was based upon. And I would have to say this is one of the key learnings that I wanted to take away uh, from this time and from me growing up in this religious circles. So then I was thinking like, okay, I have this one where I'm really frustrated at work. I'm not feeling connected to the people. And then on, and on grow up, when I was growing up, I had this experience of, yeah, I really felt connected to the people here, but it's not to do with the work. And can we combine those two? So then I was thinking about the rituals that we have in the workplace. And, uh, you know, you might have your standups on a Monday, uh, the onboarding process at your work, uh, even workshops. So I actually run now at Zalando the internal trainings for creative workshops. And even when you're doing workshops, especially now when it's a remote and online, the rituals that you have can really help connect people. And, and that's what I thought, like, can we bring this uh, great religious connection of people at the center and basing it upon rituals? And can we put it into this professional context? And how would I do that? Um, what are the benefits of that? What does that actually look like in practice? And we'll talk a little bit more that, about that later. And I thought of these three situations as really great examples, but of course the list goes on. Friday beers maybe, um, having a design club. We just had our design club today. Actually, it was quite, quite exciting. Um, and what are the different rituals that, or how could we tweak the certain rituals in a professional context that make them more human-centered? I, I would also suggest this the thing. So I, I have a little bit of a pulse check here. Um, there's a poll. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, my lovely facilitators and hosts here to throw out the poll. If you could just answer that, I would be interested to, to know how you're feeling about uh, these kind of uh, rituals. And if you're aware of them, what kind of the confidence levels of rituals are in the room? It seems that you understand a lot of rituals from your childhood. That's really fantastic. Um, but also how conscious are you in them in the creation of these rituals? Is it that you realize that they're really important? Do you feel that they're important? Or even um, are you actually actively participating in the creation of the rituals that you're in? So whether that be at work or in your private life as well, the communities or for, your, for, your, uh, for, your, for the humans that you're designing for. I wanna get away from this user's word. So yeah, okay, great. Okay, interesting spread there. Um, I can see lots of answers coming in. And I would, uh, we will share those results out in just a second. So I'm going to talk a little bit now. Um, now you see the connection and where the rituals came from in my life. So there was this need as a designer to have people connection. And then I had these experiences in my, in my childhood. But now I want to talk about some, uh, where I've seen this work really well and give you some examples of, of my experiences in the professional life, where the line has blurred uh, from uh, the professional into making it more uh, focused on, on people. So, of course, birthdays is a ritual that we probably have, and it's quite international. 
uh, Lee accepted as a ritual. And most people, I assume, have participated in some sort of ritual around, around their birthday and celebrating their birthday. One thing that I found really interesting was my time at IXDS. Uh, they had a very people-focused uh, ritual that really connected with the values of the organization. And I think that's really important. So within IXDS, the birthday ritual was that you would have a, your birthday would be coming up. The office manager would approach you and say, hey, your birthday's coming up. Um, what book would you like to receive? And then what would happen is that you would uh, say, you could look on uh, Amazon or whatever, or your leading book retailers and say, I would like to get this book. Then uh, the office manager would buy two copies. So one copy would go from you, go to you, and one copy would stay in the office library, which was a very interesting concept. So then the office library, I'm not sure how this works in the digital age anymore or working from home, but the library would be updated all the time with these new books. And then once on your birthday or maybe the all hands after your birthday, you would be asked to talk about why you chose that book and why you feel it's important for the organization to read. And we had such a diverse range of books in our library that was really just as diverse as the people that were in the organization. And what I felt this was really, really exciting um, for me as a ritual that really brought back the human focus of birthdays is that one, it was acknowledging that the people are very diverse in the organization and that they're important. So one, rewarding them for their participation, but also acknowledgement of their birthday. Uh, and that was really important. So it was a gift from the organization and, and they put up the money for that. The second one was, we really value you not because um, it's just your birthday, but also because you contain knowledge within you and expertise and, and, and understanding. And also you bring a new, unique perspective to this organization. And so then you were able to share that with the organization and also have some influence on the library and learning resources that the, that the organization had. Um, so yeah, th those two combinations really connected into the value of the agency. It was a simple ritual that also, yeah, uh, it was a really simple ritual that was easy to apply and also it was very repeatable. So we could do it for everyone's birthday and it was quite systematic. Also, one of the worst things that you might find at an organization is the design library or the, or the library for resources is always out of date. Like you get these really old books that are full of magazines that come from promotional material. And this way, another key bonus was that we had a library that was very, very interesting to look at and always continually updated. So there was a couple of other side benefits to this ritual. Okay, so that's one on the organization side. Now I'd like to talk about one on the service side uh, when we're actually creating services for, for people. So uh, I was working for Factory Berlin, which is a community of innovators. And we were tasked with creating a community that uh, was accepting, but also a little bit exclusive and safe. And, and we were tasked with uh, creating this, uh, what previously was a co-working space of about 100 people and turning it into a community of thousands of innovators. Uh, apologies. And um, one thing that we looked at was also taking a ritual from the Berlin nightclub scene. So if anyone's tried to get to Berghain or heard of Berghain, it's a very exclusive club. But once you're in Berghain, it's a very, very, um, let's say open community within the club. So we took this kind of analogy and ritual and for us to build a very safe and exclusive, but also very um, open community, we thought let's really focus on the gatekeeping. So we enforced a very strict application process here. I think we did something like one in four would be rejected or that was about the average uh, statistic. So we really curated the community. And this ritual of uh, having people imply with their intentions, what they would like to do in the community, how they're going to contribute to the community, really helped build a community that was uh, not just exclusive, but also very proactive and very exciting to be a part of. And also showed a certain level of privilege, which I think was quite exciting for, for this ritual. So the onboarding ritual here was very, very uh, good, but also taken from not a religious background or, or something, but uh, from looking at rituals, how we exist in the, the world, or in this, in this, in this case, it was uh, from Berlin. Um, yeah. So that was my second example. The third, the third thing I want to bring up in this thing, and maybe it's uh, before we go over to the case study of how we're applying this at Zalando is, I want to leave a little bit of a warning with rituals. So my experience with uh, religious groups and the organization there was once you're in, you were in. And these really, rituals really helped bring people together. Um, and 
Now, oh yeah, the poll results are up, thank you. And uh, they really brought people together in a really great way. They also aligned people, uh, bring people together to tangibly fill the, um, the values of the organization. But on one other side, and this is the real downside of rituals, and this is something that we need to be very um, clear about, is that rituals can also exclude when not done appropriately. And this is really why I advocate for uh, crafting meaningful experiences, being intentful with the rituals that we have. And so once I was out of the religious uh, uh, group and once I had left the church, I really felt excluded. I lost my friends. I wasn't in contact with them anymore. Um, and what had brought me so close together with these people also pushed me really far out of the organization because these rituals were, if you're in, you're in. And if you're not in, then you're really out. And I felt that it was a really disheartening thing. And sometimes we also do that within the rituals and organizations that we have. And one key example I think of this is uh, Friday night beers. And you might think, well, everyone does Friday night beers. Knockoff beers are like a tradition. That is like a, a cherished ritual, especially within Australian culture. Yes, I totally agree with you. But have you ever thought about people that don't drink? Or the colleagues that might have to go home and look after their kids? Have you ever thought about uh, the people that uh, only work part-time? How does this ritual creating an inclusive environment and also bringing them closer together? Because I would assume that it also pushes these people away. So within Zalando, we've also in, uh, looked at this as well, and we're redesigning our rituals to, to be more inclusive of, of everyone, especially when diversity and inclusion is such a big topic for us at Zalando, but I think in general for designers. And this is the slight little warning where it's really important to be intentful with the rituals that you have. Um, yeah, okay. So now I'm gonna move over to the application process and how and give you a bit of a case study, case study of how we did it at Zalando. And maybe you can take this and apply it to your organization or might, maybe it might even give you some inspiration of how you might apply it to your own life. So uh, over the last, I think year now, actually, we've been looking at our rituals and gatherings and how we bring the community of product insights and design to a, a new level. So yeah, this is back from November and December, 2019. This is when the initiative started and uh, it's come a long way since then, I would say. And it's been a really big learning experience, especially now we're all working from home. We had to do it again once, uh, once the lockdown kind of hit. Uh, and a year on from lockdown, I would say it's still developing. So it is a continual process, let's say. Okay, so. We uh, interviewed all of our community. We did some deep dive interviews with different members of the community from different backgrounds, with different lifestyles. We also sent out a big survey. We also had a couple of uh, group workshops as well. And this was le uh, led by my amazing colleague, uh, Annette Lay, and supported by the Design Ops uh, member, uh, Ekat, Ekat Arena. So those two uh, lovely designers and, uh, and people really did a great amount of work uh, producing these results. So I, I just want to credit them. They also wrote just recently an article on Zalando Design, uh, our Medium blog. So if you also want to dive a little bit deeper into that, then you can also read a little bit further there. So one of the key learnings um, of what we heard and got back from the community is uh, people would like rituals uh, that emphasize this moment of celebration. So it's a key moment, you know, whether it be a one year, two year celebration, anniversary or new promotion, or whether it just might be a project well done. They really wanted this uh, to come out in their work and also be celebrated in the, in the rituals. Uh, good question, Rosa. Uh, it was just uh, the product insights and design team, which is the 120 people I was speaking about. Of course, we also have uh, ZDS, which is like our, um, no, ZMS, which is our marketing designers, but they're in a different job family. That's just the way that uh, Zalando is structured. Good or bad, I'm not really sure. So yeah, uh, there was this moment of celebration. Um, yeah, so how we applied this or how I would suggest that people would apply it is when you're crafting rituals and when you're creating rituals, make sure they're also full of moments of surprise and delight. And also, when I'm talking about trainings and facilitation um, and workshops and things, I always add in this moment of saying thank you to your participants. So that's how I apply it when I'm doing a, a retro uh, retrospective or a design sprint, always having these moments, maybe at the end of every day or at the start of every day, also even just saying thank you. So thank you also for participating in this talk and attending. 
one example that really comes to mind that I think has done this really well also on the, on the product design side is if you use MailChimp, once you've sent out that email, um, they give you a high five. I think they've changed it a little bit now, but I think that moment of, of high five and celebration of a job well done is a really important moment to include in our rituals. And this is how you can make them effective. Um, I have to say also, if there was like a high five moment whenever you exported for PDF, when you were in your InDesign files, oh, that would have been gold. That was a real missed opportunity from Adobe, but uh, I'm sure not the only one. All right, number two. Designers and the community also suggested to us that they really want a moment to connect and bond with ease. So how can we create rituals that help them bring them together? So there was things about, you know, it's not just about bonding over the work we do, but also bonding because we like each other and we might actually be friendly to each other. How great would it be to laugh together, build trust, um, also share difficulties and strugglings, um, whether it be a physical space or the ritual. This was something that uh, was really highlighted by the community. And again, how I would apply this is <laughs> uh, the best example I could think of was slack socks. And although this isn't a ritual, if you get some slack socks, you really feel connected to that community. We also have Zalando socks and they're probably way better than the slack socks, I have to say. But having this kind of ritual where you can have this sense of belonging um, uh, yeah, to the wider community, we also have uh, sharing and learn outs. Uh, we also have many different rituals, but also for your users and the people that are around you setting up, well, Slack community is just the start, but you can go even further to um, give them badges and rewards or acknowledge their part to belong with the different people. I just joined as a mentor on Adpolis, so an amazing design people list. And one of the great rituals that they do is their onboarding experience for, for new mentors is really, really quite nice. And, and they really acknowledge each people. And not only should you introduce yourself in the community, but you're also invited to a new mentor uh, online get together. And there they run some activities as well. And I thought that was a nice ritual that they did. Um, so thirdly, what people said to us was that uh, there is a hunger to be inspired. Uh, Friday, Friday demos is our way of, of sharing inspiration, but I don't think that's everything. But it was really highlighted that people want to be continuously learning uh, inspiration from what other people are doing, gather new insights or different ways of doing things. Um, and this was really highlighted quite quite clearly for us as number three. And so when we apply this, um, it's also interesting that uh, the rituals that you, you have should create value for the people. And this is what we decided to do in a lot of our rituals. How can we make sure that people are continuously learning, whether it be through a training or whether it be through inviting external guests or whether it be through acknowledging these learnings. But one great example I thought in terms of a product or a service is the um, Ein Gute Plan, which is German for a good, a good plan, a good diary. Uh, let's see. Um, but they also have organized rituals so that you leave not just having documented what you do, but also having learned something as well. And, and this layout and this idea of this ritual of not just uh, writing down the simple diary entry, but also learning and, and getting reflective and learning these methods of reflection is also really important when it comes to creating rituals. Okay, I have one more and I'm almost at the end of my presentation. So make sure to throw in lots of questions there. Um, uh, yeah, that would be fantastic. So uh, yeah, so one bonus one is, and this is always like the, the real crux of it, do what works. Um, if it's not working and if you have a ritual that is trying to create value, or help in inspire people or bring people closer together. And you're like, this ritual just isn't working. <laughs> we have super low attendance or something like this. Uh, then I would just suggest to stop it. Uh, move on, create something new, try something and build it up naturally. And the best story I can think of is uh, probably, you know, Bodie McBoatface or Training McTrainface. But before all of those internet memes, there was Save Mr. Splashy Pants. And now the, the, <laughs> the, um, the, um, I think it was wildlife protection, uh, so w, WF, I think we're trying to increase awareness for, for whale conservation. Um, and they had all these serious names, but of course they threw up the poll and suggestions to an online uh, resource, uh, online open um, response. And the internet got a hold of this and of course changed it. 
So Mr. Splashy Pants, and they were thinking, no, 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 it has to be a serious name. We have to name this whale so that people will build empathy and it has to be someone serious. They totally lost control and Mr. Splashy Pants was by far the highest rated uh, response. So they named this whale Mr. Splashy Pants. And the internet really loved it. Everyone really got involved in saving the, this whale and whale awareness and conservation really got into a whole new level. So sometimes we have the intent to create rituals for our community or for our users, and they completely change it on us. But that's okay. That is part of the rituals, and that's being and part of being intentful for, for rituals. Now, if the rituals turn negative, obviously you can stop it and intervene, but creating rituals that work for the people that are in them is really, really important. I think Mr. Splashy Pants is a great example of that. Okay. Here is a little bit of a summary. So when we're creating rituals, what we found for Zalando and our community was that rituals uh, should uh, surprise and delight and enable celebration, that uh, they should enable belonging to have that connection and the need for connection, um, that they should create value and, um, oh, enable, <laughs> sorry, bad spelling mistake, uh, inspiration. And finally, they should do things that work. So we actually got rid of our Thursday inspirations. So we had like a inspiration session on Thursday. We moved it to a Friday and changed the format. We got rid of drinking and Friday night beers and replaced that for something else. We introduced smaller design clubs. So we're constantly iterating and finding what works for our community. Some things stayed around for a long time and have become part of the DNA of the organization. Some things disappeared and that's okay. That is totally okay. Okay. I think one thing that I want you to take away, and this is really important. So remember when I was talking about my religious experience of creating people space and how there was a lack of that people space in my professional work and in the organizations that I are a part of. One thing that I want you to look at when you go back to your work after lunch and you've finished eating your food is think about how can I, as a person in this community, create more people space? If everyone in this uh, group chat or all 40 of you actually thought about this idea of creating people space and how you could do that and be intent on that, oh, my job would be done. That would be fantastic. Could you please also help me to create more people space? Okay. To do that, I have a bit of a template and I can share the template that we use when we're proposing new rituals. Um, you can steal this. You could also just take a screenshot right now. I can also share out my slides a little bit later. Um, yeah really super simple stuff. It just helps us document what new rituals we want to do. It helps us plan with the design operations team, who's going to run it, how often will it happen, who's going to be responsible, where is the content and inspiration coming from, how will it run, etc. This really helped us also ideate some new rituals and get some uh, of those old habits out, I would say. Okay, if you're wanting more, um, then I would suggest that you check out the two articles on Zalando Design at Medium. Um, I would also suggest that you get to books, Rituals for Work, and uh, also look into Ritual Design Lab. And there's, I think there's also now Rituals for uh, uh, Remote Work as well um, by Corsat and Margaret. They're like two amazing, amazing people coming from Stanford, and they do so much great work. Um, and if you want to get more involved, we also had Ted Matthews on for the service design drinks a few months back now, um, talking about ritual design and how he applies it. Uh, he's a Norwegian uh, professor, and he's also worked with their big football teams to create design rituals. Um, he's also done it in many different situations and in a much higher level. He's actually writing his PhD around ritual design. And finally, one thing that I think really helped me connect these two parts of my religious side to my professional side is a talk by Alan de Breton from School of Life, also a great organization and group um, about atheism 2.0. So not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. That's an expression in English. I'm not sure how it translates, but yeah. Uh, that was a really inspiring talk that I felt helped me interpret my religious upbringing and how I could apply it further. Okay. So now is a bit of discussion time. I would like to open up the floor. If you have some questions, then please, uh, throw them in the chat now and we can have a look at them. If you would like to uh, ask a question directly, you can also just put up your hand and I will stop sharing my screen. And then a little bit later, I'm going to wrap up with uh, one or two pieces of promotion. And then I think that's it for us today. Great. Thank you so much for listening to my talk. Are you still alive? 
Yeah, thank you very much for coming and uh, talking to us, uh, Adam. Actually, um, I think it was a great talk and uh, there are not so many questions because we explained everything so well. I have a question though, if no one wants to, to go first. And uh, my question is, do you have any ritual for uh, the ritual design? I mean, uh, do you have uh, a retro for the rituals? How do you decide to stop something? How do you decide to try something new? And uh, stuff like that, this would be of interest. Um, well, sometimes it's very easy to stop rituals, maybe because just no one's attending anymore. Yeah. It dies off quite naturally and you just need to pull the plug. I think what comes as a challenge here is that sometimes rituals go through this really high peak of participation when they're all new and then they're going to go through a slump and getting through that slump into this, okay, now it's part of our, our core organization and part of the things that we do. That little slump there is sometimes uh, a make or break. So whether it be that you just kill it off or whether you actually say, no, it really is good and we're going to keep investing and then it will come up uh, a little bit further. We found that with a few of our rituals, especially things like uh, what we call Passion Thursdays, like share outs and getting people and designers. And we've had to tweak it a few times to do that. So either we say we're going to tweak it. And normally this happens like, I would say like if it's a weekly event or something like this, like three or four months in, we normally have this discussion. But because we also do ownership through design operations team and they kind of support us, we also have like some reflection with them as well. Maybe there's one or two sessions where well, no one wanted to share and we're like, okay, what do we do? Um, and then we kind of do this. Um, but initially when we were doing this project and asking all of these people for the feedback, we also looked at all of the rituals and we had a calendar and we're like, well, this is too much. Like no one's going to actually be able to attend all of these, especially when we're, we're being bombarded with endless Zoom calls kind of thing. So that was the other action. Yeah. Sure, of uh, course. And you answered also my next question, which would be about the design ops, if they are getting involved or not. Uh, and now I think I can give to Celeste. Uh, do I pronounce your name uh, correctly? Um, yeah. Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's fine. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Adam, for this talk. I think it was fantastic. So I have a question uh, related to so remote teams in cases where you might be in different time zones. I don't know if you have tips. I think if you're remote and everybody's in, a, in the same time zone, you might get around it by having video calls. But I was wondering if you have any tips about how you uh, might um, yeah, promote rituals in a team that is distributed in different yeah. ways. So I think um, rituals don't have to be a group ritual every time. And um, one thing that I've helped and I've started to implement in a lot of the workshops that I'm running is um, having something that's also physical, whether that be sending them something or going to get something or documenting something. Um, getting people, I feel, outside of this everything has to be through Zoom uh, mentality is also a great way. And I don't know if you ever watched a movie where they break the fourth wall or they speak to the audience directly. Um, I find having something physical uh, really helps do that. So for the last workshop we did, we everyone received, I think, a bag of popcorn and then we made like an activity out of the popcorn. Or um, another one uh, was uh, we did like a design sprint. Everyone, what was it? Was it tea? It was some sort of like food thing. And then everyone had to document where they were drinking their tea or something like this. So it was like an asynchronous ritual where everyone was able to get away from their computer and do something. That was one idea we had. Um, and the other thing I think is to just be intentional with the rituals that you might have, whether it be setting up like a spontaneous coffee between two people. I recently got involved with or started reading about um, uh, a new like ideation method, which is called one, two, four, all, which is like a pair comes up, like you come up with an idea, then you share it with a pair then the pair shares it with four and then four shares it with the whole group. And I have find by using leveraging those kind of breakouts is also kind of a nice way of, of coming up with different rituals to, to think about. And also like talking or discussing, um, yeah, being intentional and creating those is, is a huge thing now that most people are doing remote work. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if anyone else has any other ideas, then I would love you to throw them in. Um, but I think getting people away from the computer has been the best benefit for creating rituals that kind of have some impact, um, that has been helpful for me. So, yeah. yeah that's, a, that's a great tip actually. Thank you very much. Um, Nikos has a question. Do you want to read it out or should I just, I'll, I'll just 
do it. So uh, was it an organization decision to focus on ritual design for designers? Uh, no, <laughs> I wish. Um, I don't, I think it was a, a known aspect of the community that we should be improving and looking into. Um, I think um, if it was on them, then they probably would have uh, done it differently. Although there was support from uh, management, definitely there was involvement from them. They also had a lot of concerns and they also had a lot of uh, input and direction. And they also heard a lot of the feedback coming from the community. But I think the idea to focus on that was also community and uh, based. So they, they got permission from management or we got permission from management. And then we were also able to implement these different things. Um, and I think that's also important. I don't think back on the time that everything came from the top, but it was more like a uh, people gathered to make rituals work for them and then organize themselves. And empowering those people that influence or create those is really, really important. And I think uh, when I think about my time in church also, like it was if someone wanted to run the youth group or activities or what someone wanted to set up a Bible study in a certain area, it was like, can I do this? Yes. What would you like us to do to help you do that? And uh, we also found that within Factory Berlin, once the community got over to about a thousand people, we said, okay, let's implement some small groups or circles, we called them. And then whoever wants to run a circle, whether it be designers or copywriters, we had some about legal design. We actually had uh, Space and Pepper doing one about uh, interior, architect uh, 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 interior architecture. And then we empowered those people to run and organize those rituals. So we gave them uh, permission as well. Uh, Nicholas, do you want to expand on that? Yeah. Yeah, it's just that I've seen in, in I have like in my previous experience, I've seen that it's there is a shift with uh, let's say a focus on on the mental. Uh, mindset of the designer and usually these creative processes are focused on designers and or let's say creatives yeah where basically it's beneficial for everyone and it's more on an organizational level and not so much on a you know mindset level where everyone comes in with their own creativity and just wants to pull in some ritual yeah yeah I, yeah i mean who, who takes the onus at the end of the day and and probably it would benefit everyone if they were intentional on the rituals they were creating for their groups um i mean if that was the case already i wouldn't be here talking about ritual design that's for sure yeah. um um yeah i i often have that you know like i would love to develop across the entire you know, 20,000 or so people of Zalando to create rituals that really make it about the people and stuff like this. It would be amazing. Um, I can't do that. I don't have all the capacity to do that, nor do I want to be responsible. And I think the last point of doing something that works is also doing something that works for the people that are in that. So if we were to do a ritual in design, it probably wouldn't apply also to the engineer community. It probably wouldn't yeah. also apply to um, people, uh, you know, is, is the Zalando terminology, uh, HR community. And it would be wrong for me to kind of dictate those rituals that they should be doing because that's uh, kind of a top down. Um, but yeah, I totally see the need. And I'm, I think my way of attacking this is also to focus on enablement rather than actually like prescribing different things. And this is why it's really important to do what works as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great. I want to quantify these activities. Um, Prachi, uh, would you like to ask this question? I'm, I'm interested to know what you would like, uh, would, yeah, what you mean yeah, by this. So, uh, so I was just thinking, uh, did they ask you questions about uh, what is the return on investment, for example, uh, the kind of time or money or anything? Did they, did you face questions like that? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> uh, like, why are we spending money on this? Or can't you do your work? And why do you feel this is important? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, um, yes, it's their job to ask those questions, I would say, uh, to, to, to question the rituals and to, to do this. They're also getting all the feedback from the people that they're managing that, you know, oh, it's so, I feel so lonely and, oh, my, you know, da, 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 I'm struggling with this. So I, it wasn't much to convince them that it was that we needed to do something, but I think it was also their thing to say like, okay, we're not going to do a week off site with everyone. And we're going to go, you know, get away and stuff like that. That's not within the scope. We need to find smaller initiatives that we can run over time. Um, so they put on some constraints. 
some things I didn't agree. I still think doing a week offsite would have been absolutely awesome. And to really like have that youth camp experience, like experience where everyone's just so connected and so together and we really know what we're doing and it was all about the people and you know, it really felt great. But they asked that they have to have to be responsible uh, to themselves, to the community and to their stakeholders, which might be upper, upper management or the sea level. Um, yeah, so yes, but also in a good way, not always uh, the worst of ways. Um, but again, if, if they could say like, hey, Adam, you can spend like 50% of your time on the doing this design rituals and, and creating rituals for the organization, I'd be like, woohoo. But um, yeah, that, that would be even better. But yeah, it's their job and that conflict. And I guess that friction between yourself and the organization and the people that are responsible is, is also about understanding the feasibility there. So good question. Very good question. What are some of your rituals, Adam? Any pro tips for a best ritual to adopt? Um, I have one tweak that might be really interesting. Who does a stand up here? Like if if you if you do like a Monday morning stand up, uh, we also have design clubs. Um, I'm sure that most people in this organization would do like a Monday morning stand up. Adding one small adjustment to this is really, really helpful. Uh, adding what are you thankful for or what are you looking forward to this week, adding that question into your stand-ups can really change the dynamic of this. Um, often people are quite negatively inclined when they're focusing on what they have to do or what they want to do, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I find adding this, okay, what are you thankful for or what are you excited for, adds a different mental state that uh, can actually uh, change the dynamic of the team and the discussion and the tone of the discussion. So it's also what we've found, I have to say at Zalando, is that not whether we reinvented the wheel. We always did some inspirational talks and share outs, but adjusting them to make it better um, is also a big part of the rituals and this iterative process. So yeah, give that one a shot. Um, if that enables you buying with your stakeholders, then I would say double down. Okay. If you have more questions, please write them in. I will get back to you or I can email you or you can reach out to me and we can have a discussion and a coffee. I also have, like I said, mentoring sessions on at Palist. Uh, 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 uh. Um, if you would like some mentoring on this kind of thing or discussion or FaceTime or uh, to throw up some questions and have further discussion, then we're totally fine for do that. You can book directly into my calendar, which is somewhat scary, but it's okay. I permit you to do that. Uh, and you can reach out to me there. Okay, so do do. Uh, I have the final question if, uh, oh, yeah. if the time permits. Uh, and uh, would it make sense for uh, from your perspective, I mean, with your experience, to uh, find some common uh, rituals between other departments as well? For example, it's not only for designers, but uh, we could have a ritual which uh, would uh, combine design and engineering and the rest somehow. And uh, would it make sense to spend this time and uh, resources to, to assist that? Or do you think it would be too difficult to, to, to find? Uh, something that could bring these people together because from my perspective but i'm not really sure this is the case uh it's always good to all, to also include people who are, you are working with but you don't really belong to the same uh group of people let's say i mean if they are not designer they are something uh as i mean and uh it's good to get to know this as a person as well not only the street uh work uh, environment that uh, could be yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, yes, of course. And totally for that. That that sounds really exciting. I would even say, like, take it one step further and why not include your your the, the people that you're designing for, uh, even whether it be your customers and stuff like this, and include them in rituals to, to do this. And one one way that I even saw this happening for um if anyone anyone remembers Wonderlist, they were bought out by Microsoft, um, was was a, a listing, but um within their processes they also had a a Friday user test. They just had this as a ritual in their organization. Um, and you could say that's part of the voice of customer process and or user research process, but they actually made it a ritual that everyone would go there and actually do this every Friday. And that was always on. I would say you could also do stuff with your, your stakeholders across department or even with your customers. That was one key learning that we had from uh, building the community uh, from Factory Berlin was to involve the community and we had uh, dinners actually with 
influential community members every week and that would change and it was also again an application process and then it would focus on uh, networking with the people and doing a some sort of like campfire talk but also we invited them for dinner and um, that ritual of also invo involving the people that we were designing for and creating our service for was also really impactful of course it doesn't have to be a big dinner or anything um, and it should be appropriate to your context um, but that's really was really helpful yeah. Okay. Um, in the sake of time, I have to, uh, by obligation to my company, and uh, we're so awesome at Zalando, but if you are uh, looking for a new job as a designer, or just in general, I mean, you can do whatever you would like, uh, then uh, we are doing some hiring days. So you could get an answer within 48 hours, uh, which is a new ritual we are trying <laughs> uh, to increase the time and um, we heard lots of feedback around, okay, like it takes like two months to get feedback from you. Uh, why does it take so long? I just applied and I would like some answer the conversations. We're losing great candidates. So we took this feedback and now we created these hiring days as a ritual. So uh, it's like a 48 hour sprint of getting people's applications in, uh, looking through them and getting them rapid responses. So really focusing on time, uh, feedback and uh, this kind of thing for hiring. Um, so if you would like to participate on that, um, I can share a link with you. Um, it will also be linked in the slides. <laughs> Shivers. Sorry, hang on two seconds. I will get the link for you. And um, yeah, so that's uh, really exciting. Then the other thing was, uh, like I mentioned before, service design drinks. Woo! We have uh, Mark Fontaine, uh, who is um head of everything at service design jobs but also hosts the service design show so this is uh the person who talks with like all the great influential people in service design but he's also a very fantastic service designer himself and has a lot of uh interesting input and things to say and we're really looking forward to that and that's tonight so tonight at 6 p.m uh, berlin time if you'd like to join us that's and nice. that's it Thank awesome. you. Thank you very much for being here. We are excited having you and uh, we hope you have the, the chance to have you again on other topics or to, to do something together as discussed uh, earlier. Um, it was a really uh, insightful talk. I hope for everyone got something uh, tonight. At least I did. So I feel great uh, about the time spent here. Yeah. And um, yeah, I will try to to keep up with you also for this mentoring that you asked for if it's possible for rituals i think uh personally i need it for my job so i will come back to you thank you very much i have to also say thank you to this is hd hd uh network uh, for allowing us today to, to have this event and uh for this this is doing which is an educational uh platform where we can uh, learn a lot about design, service design, but also other disciplines, um, human-centered design, I would say, because everything comes under this umbrella, from my perspective, at least, the all human design documents. Yeah, and, and Adam St. John Lawrence also sends his regards and his hellos, and his, uh, we also had him as a guest speaker and talked about this is doing. It was also fantastic to hear about all the great learning opportunities there for the non-service designers <laughs> or non designers in the crowd, maybe. Yeah, they are supporting us uh, really well, and we are really uh, happy to uh, mention them. If you like, check them out. Uh, I will send the link uh, in the comments as well. And uh, of course, thank you all of you uh, for joining us. It was a great discussion, and I think a really good uh, participation. And uh, we are looking forward to see you in uh, one of our next events. We have already two in the making, so um, stay tuned, and uh, we will let you know what's happening next. Thank you all. Thank you, Adam. And um, we will see you uh, again soon. Thank you, everyone, for joining. It's Thank such an honor. Yeah, it was great. Have a lovely rest of the day. Bye.